morning, everyone. I'm sorry for the delay. We we're having just having some good fellowship back there, and I know y'all were having some good fellowship out here, so that's okay. Um, <clears throat> thanks for being here this morning for our Bible class. Let's get started, of course, by going to God in prayer. Uh, let's especially keep uh, Ernie and all the Baines in prayer with his, his uh, mom uh, still in the hospital. Um, does anyone have any specific update? Maybe they that they'd be willing to share. No, I didn't. I don't have one either. So, Sue. yes, we want to keep Sue in prayer. Some of you may have uh, talked to her or seen her her post on the Facebook group. Want to be praying for her and Daryl. Um, let's continue to pray for Dale and Doris. And Doris. Yes. Mary? Okay. Let's keep the Grove family in prayer. You may have seen about um, Elizabeth Grove's, was it sister in law? Yes. What was her first name? Jaretta. Jaretta. Anyone else? Uh, Kelsey's father is here with us, and one of her sisters is going to be traveling in. Uh, so he, we want to give thanks that he made it safely. One of Kelsey's sisters is going to be traveling in this afternoon, so I want to pray for safe travels for her. Okay, well, uh, bow with me. Let's go to God in prayer. Thank you, Father, for this Lord's Day. Thank you that we can gather together on this Lord's Day and worship you. Pray you're glorified in our time of praise, and, um, and we pray that we're blessed in this hour as well as we open up your word. Uh, bless our, our reading, our thinking, our understanding of it. Father, we pray that you will continue to watch over us throughout this week as you have um, this past week and every week before. You, you shower so many blessings on us every day. We're so grateful for them and pray that you will equip us to live lives of more and more gratitude to you. Father, we lift up those we mentioned uh, this morning who need you in different ways. We want to pray for Ernie and his family, and we pray especially for his mother, that you'll bless her in the hospital. Uh, watch over her and the doctors taking care of her. Uh, we pray that all will be well and that you will go with that entire family. We also want to lift up our sister Sue, that you'll continue to bless her um, with uh, the struggle with cancer. Uh, we know she received some, some uh, not so positive news the other day. We pray that you'll continue to bless her and Daryl. So thankful for the ways that you have equipped them so far on this journey. So grateful for the light that they both are and grateful that, um, that you've been with them and pray that you'll continue to go with both of them. I want to pray for Dale and Doris. Uh, grateful that we were able to see Doris with us a couple weeks ago and Dale has been able to be with us a couple times lately. Uh, we love them and pray that you will continue to watch over them and their health. We also think of Jim and Ruth Reynolds, who are not able to make it very often anymore, and we lift up them. We we'll pray for Doris's sister in the hospital. Uh, bless her, watch over her health. You know all that's going on there and what she needs. Uh, we pray for the family of Jaretta Grow, that you'll comfort them as they will miss her, and bless also April Feltner and her family in the loss of her father. Uh, we pray for the Fries as they'll be traveling. We pray that you'll keep them safe. Pray also for Kelsey's sister who will be traveling up, and we're grateful that, uh, that her father has already made it here safely. Lord, again, bless this hour. Uh, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Well, it's been a couple weeks since we've been in Acts together. Uh, grateful to the elders for a, a great Shepherd Sunday last week. Grateful during Bible class hour for, for Chris's overview of ancient Greece, setting some of the context of where we've been uh, for so much of Acts. Um, last time that we were in the text of Acts, we were reading about Paul's ministry in Ephesus. And um, we've actually now been reading in one way or another about Paul in Ephesus for the past three weeks. So quite a bit of time spent uh, that, that we've been spending together reading about Paul's ministry there. Does anyone recall why it is that we've spent so long there? Why is Ephesus so significant in the book of Acts. Anyone remember? 
Ephesus is really where Paul has his um, most successful mission work. Now, really, he's successful in the sense that he's doing the Lord's will everywhere. But if we want to talk about success in terms of number of folks converted and amazing things that are happening and those kinds of, uh, I guess, more human standards, this is where Paul has his most successful mission work. Uh, He stays there longer than any other place in Acts. God works some really amazing miracles through him. Of course, God is doing amazing things all throughout the book of Acts, but in Paul's ministry in Ephesus, it's miraculous activity at a whole different kind of level. Um, And also we read how not just that city of Ephesus, but the whole province of Asia Minor, uh, which is the province that Ephesus is located in, that whole region hears the gospel through through Paul's ministry in Ephesus. So uh, these reasons make Ephesus kind of like the This is kind of where Paul peaks in the book of Acts in terms of missionary travel. So we were reading about the effects of Paul's work, really God's work through Paul last time. Uh, And we talked about how the religious beliefs and practices of Ephesus were really kind of um, definitely undermined and almost kind of overrun by the gospel, by, by Paul's ministry. So we talked about how the gospel undermined what I was calling folk religion, or uh, just kind of the practice of the common people, specifically the practice of magic. Uh, We read about a lot of folks who were converted to Christ, came together and burned their books that contained, you know, their magical, you know, spells and instructions and things like that, uh, burned those books in public. And the the cost of those books altogether was 50,000 pieces of silver. So this is not a cheap book burning. Uh, So this is a a massive display of people completely turning away from their old life, turning to Christ. And then we began reading uh, about how the gospel also undermined uh, what I called state religion. I guess that actually civic religion would be more accurate, but it's the official religion of Ephesus. Uh, That's where we left off. So Luke tells us how that happens by telling us about this riot that occurs in Ephesus Uh, that it breaks out over Paul's teaching. So what we're going to do this morning, because it's been a couple weeks and we just barely started reading about the riot, uh, we're going to back up and work through the whole riot in Ephesus. And um, again, when we were reading about people burning their books before the riot, uh, we got this strong display of how fiercely converted a number of the Ephesians were Uh, They were giving their whole selves over to Christ. In this riot, we kind of get the contrast. Uh, We get a strong display of how fiercely opposed some people are to the gospel. Uh, This is, I think, really important for us to remember in our own uh, walks with Christ, especially in our attempts to shine the light of Christ and share the good news and reflect his character. The gospel is truly good news, really is, but it's not good news that everyone wants to hear or at least it's not good news that everyone's ready to hear the moment that we might share it or the moment they might see the way we live. Uh, We hope and pray that over time, even if someone is initially repulsed by the gospel, that their hearts are softened and they are drawn to it. But God does respect our free will. He won't force himself on us. Um, So some of the Ephesians are hearing this good news and feel very threatened by the gospel. And we'll see how they feel threatened in just a bit. Uh, And so they respond with this really strong opposition to it. Uh, So this kind of reminds me of Jesus' teaching when he says, I didn't come to bring peace on earth but a sword. And what he meant there is not that he came to lead violence uh, or something like that, but he he meant he, he knew his message was going to be divisive, even breaking up individual families and things like that. And so here we see a city divided over the message of Jesus. Okay, Um, now before we started reading last time, uh, I did make these points about official or or state religion in Ephesus and also other cities in the Roman Empire as well. Uh, So this is the official, uh, the the government-supported worship of the gods and goddesses. So I just want to review these points briefly uh, because it it will really impact, I think it will guide the way we read this riot that breaks out. Uh, one, state religion was a fundamental part of Ephesus's culture. Uh, so if a person refused to take part in worshiping the gods and goddesses, that was considered a very antisocial behavior. It was considered kind of rebellious against society. You were 
um, you were showing that you just weren't going to go along with these well-established practices. And also, many people believed that uh, worshiping these gods wasn't just a cultural thing. I mean, it was, but it was more than that. It was also considered uh, essential to cities like Ephesus having the prosperity that they had, the safety they had, the prosperity they had, because they believed that the gods were blessing them with those things in return for the worship that those gods were receiving. So the thinking naturally is, well, if a lot of people stop doing this, if they stop worshiping the gods, then uh, you're really endangering the, the entire city because the gods might strike the city with a plague or, or you know, we might lose our prosperity or something terrible could happen. There could be an earthquake or, or and we can think of any number of kinds of ways that a city could be endangered. And then also, state religion was a big moneymaker for people in Ephesus and a big moneymaker for the city as a whole. Um, and so here in Ephesus, the worship of one particular goddess named Artemis, who's going to come up in our passage, uh, she was of a, a, special, a special level of importance to that city. Uh, we talked last time about this massive temple to Artemis that is just outside the city gates of Ephesus, was considered one of the seven wonders of the world at the time. Uh, and so it was just an incredible sight to see. Uh, and again, it was all devoted to this one particular god. So as we read this account of the riot in Ephesus, we'll see some of these uh, factors really come into play. So uh, let's go ahead and read the first part of this. This is verses 23 through 27. Uh, could I get a volunteer to read this passage for us? Barbara. About that time there arose no little disturbance concerning the way. For a man named Demetrius, a silversmith, who made silver shrines of Artemis, brought no little business to the craftsmen. These were gathered together with the workmen in similar trades and said, Men, you know that from this business we have our wealth. And you see and hear that not only in Ephesus, but it, in almost all of Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned away a great many people, saying that gods made with hands are not gods. And one more verse on the next slide. And there is danger, not only that this trade of ours may come into disrepute, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis may be counted as nothing and that she may even be disposed from her magnificence, she whom all Asia and the world worship. Okay, so right here, we don't actually read about the riots yet. What Luke first tells us about is what starts the riot. And what starts it is a speech given by a silversmith uh, with the name Demetrius. And what does Luke tell us here about Demetrius? What, as, he, as he's this uh, craftsman, uh, the silversmith, what what types of things does he make? He makes shrines to yeah, yeah, he makes shrines to Artemis. So of course you got the big temple to Artemis, but people may also have uh, little sections of their homes or businesses or other parts of the city devoted to her as well. And so he's involved in making these things. So this is someone whose line of work is really bound up with the official religion of Ephesus. So this fellow Demetrius, he uh, gathers together um, his fellow craftsmen and along with others who do similar things, and he makes a speech to them. Uh, this is a little bit like workers' unions today, um, in this, kind of in the same way. Uh, in ancient times, people had associations or guilds uh, that brought people of the same line of work together. This existed 2,000 years ago. Uh, and, and there were even some that weren't even work-related uh, a big thing was how were, were you going to be taking was your body going to be buried when you passed away and so some people just got together and the whole purpose of the association was to care for one another and make sure everyone received a proper burial so that's completely off topic but anyways there are all these kinds of associations and some of them were work related and this is one of them um, and so this type of group of people already exists which means it, it wouldn't be too hard for Demetrius to just call a meeting of the association and and make his speech. And so we read his speech here, and notice as he talks, notice what he appeals to. 
uh, he first appeals to the craftsmen's wallets. He says, you know that we have our wealth from this business. Again, the official religion of Ephesus was a big money maker for a lot of people, including these craftsmen. Uh, he also appeals to his, his uh, fellow craftsmen's pride in their city, their, their pride in their, their culture. He says it's possible, because of what's going on, it's possible that uh, the great temple of Artemis, you know, one of the seven wonders of the world at the time, just a magnificent structure, uh, it could be countered, it could be considered as nothing. It could be regarded as, people could come to view it as just completely irrelevant uh, if, if they aren't careful. Uh, and then also he, um, let me see, I might need to go back. Yep, he also uh, appeals to their religious devotion. He says, uh, Artemis herself may cease to receive the kind of worship that she is due. She may cease to receive the kind of worship that ensures Ephesus continues to um, receive her good favor and receive her blessings. And all of this, he says, uh, is because of this fellow Paul, right? The, the figure we, we know from, from so much of Acts. All this is because of Paul, who's preaching and teaching his miracles. Uh, this has turned people away from worshiping Artemis, uh, just like we, we read a couple weeks ago, how Paul's ministry turned people away from practicing magic. Demetrius is saying they're also turning away from worshiping Artemis. And... Uh, Paul is turning them away by teaching them what we know is the truth. He's saying that uh, the gods that are made with hands, the gods that uh, people have made statues of and idols of, which is the very line of work that Demetrius is involved in, uh, those gods are not really gods. So we've read Paul say this kind of thing in other parts of Acts. Back in Acts chapter 17, uh, he was telling the people of Athens how the, the true creator of the universe, he doesn't dwell in temples made with hands. He doesn't look like the kind of images we create. So Paul is, is saying these same kinds of things here in Ephesus. So Demetrius here is feeling genuinely threatened by Paul. And he feels that all of Ephesus uh, and really all of Asia Minor, again, the region that, that Ephesus is in, they should all feel threatened, uh, and he says that even go the goddess Artemis herself is being threatened. Uh, and so he makes this speech to his fellow craftsmen, who probably already think and feel much the same way as Demetrius. Uh, he, he makes this speech to them in order to, to rouse them to come to Artemis' defense, um, and also come to the defense of Ephesus, also to protect their own wallets, uh, so this is a really powerful combination of things that Demetrius is tapping into. Uh, defense of religion, defense of your city, defense of your finances. Uh, that's a combination that naturally gets these people riled up, and uh, that's kind of a timeless combination. That will always get people uh, riled up as well. But th this is the nature of Demetrius's speech, and we'll see in the next passage just how well it works. So that's Demetrius' speech. I'm sorry for the, the feedback here. Uh, does anyone have any questions or, or comments on this passage before we move forward? Uh, Barbara and then Bob. So Ephesus is in what we know is the Persian Empire? Uh-huh. Okay. And this is under Roman rule. Mm -hmm. And Romans had their own set of gods. Ki kind of. So, okay, so I could, I'm just trying to imagine, you know, the frustration these people might be feeling like the Romans aren't really going to back them up because they don't care about their gods. Oh, yeah. Well, so... so so the Romans uh, are kind of, we can think of the, Ro this might be a terrible analogy, but it just came to my mind. We can think of the Romans and culture in general, including religion, kind of like Americans with food. Uh, there's not a lot of food that's just like totally authentically American, but we love Mexican and Italian and, um, help me out. I mean, tons of, you know, Indian food, t culture, food from all over. Uh, and the Roman Empire did kind of the same thing when they conquered. Uh, they were really gruff, militaristic, powerful people, but they weren't very well cultured, and then they encountered Greek culture, and they basically just swallowed it and kind of made it their own, in a way. Uh, and this includes the gods and goddesses. They gave them different names. Um, so Zeus is the Greek god. It's the same god for the Romans, but he has the name Jupiter, and so on and so forth. But 
Greco-Roman culture, the Romans kind of adopted Greek culture, and the Greeks didn't necessarily always appreciate that. They always they, they also wanted to say, this is still our culture, but you're ruling over us. But it, it was kind of a, a hodgepodge. It wasn't so much two distinct things going on. Yes, um, this would be concerning to the Romans um, if, if Rome heard about this. And if we make it far enough in the class this morning, we'll see uh, this kind of get hinted at. The Roman Empire just doesn't like chaos and disturbance, naturally. They want law and order. And um, if the local religion is getting uh, turned on its head, they're really not, they're one going to want to put a stop to that. Yeah. Uh, Bob, you got a question as well. Yeah. 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 Um, the gospel is affecting him in a really significant way, in the ways that Jesus said it would when he was on earth. He talks about the necessity of being ready to leave even father and mother and spouses and homes for, for his sake. And Demetrius naturally is not a convert, so he's not ready to do that. Um, and so he's, um, he's resisting. Mary? Yeah, and uh, the Old Testament even talks about that uh, when the prophets are, are, you know, really saying some strong things about idolatry because a lot of the Israelites were doing it. They said, like, this is completely foolish. You cut down a tree and you carve it and then you set it up. And, like, and, and so even the Bible knows, uh, not even the Bible, the Bible knows how foolish that is. But you're right. In other ways, we can do the same thing. We can spend our lives pursuing things we know we know are, we're not going to take with us, but we do it anyway, you know. Yeah, Barbara. You know, when I was doing info health care, I had a client who was a Jewel. Mm. She had this beautiful handmade, crafted um, tent. And, yeah. you know, during her prayer service, she opened that up and I said, there's do this in there. And yeah. she turned her and said, I think she should do it. She kneeled down and prayed. Yeah. And, you know, there are other religions that have this same sort of yeah. Shrines in their homes too. Yeah. We should we should pray too. So yeah. I had a put this Artemis type of thing on the same level as Judas and, mm -hmm. and getting our clients. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Anything else? Yep. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, Diana is, is the Roman name for Artemis. Yeah. Yeah. Anything that's going to interfere with that. And there are certain things that we have a right to learn about when it comes to this. But the, the point remains is that it's a singular minded issue. Mm. And that's and that's what you're trying to get to. Yeah. Everybody knows that Ephesus was the city of Diana or Artemis, and this is interfering. 
Mm-hmm. We don't like to have our lives as Christians here. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's a fundamental piece of their culture, their identity, and they're seeing it threatened. And, I mean, it's not like they're wrong. It, Paul, Paul is <laughs> speaking a message that's in opposition to it, you know. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, uh, so this is the speech that sparks the riot. Let's go ahead and read the riot now. Um, this is verses 28 through 34, uh, would someone like to read this passage for us? Go ahead, Barbara. When they heard this, they were enraged and were crying out, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. So the city was filled with the confusion, and they rushed together into the theater, dragging with them Gaius and Aristarchus, Macedonians who were Paul's companions in travel. But when Paul wished to go in among the crowd, the disciples would not let him. And even some of the Asiarchs, who were friends of his, sent to him and were urging him not to venture into the theater. Now some cried out one thing, some another, for the assembly was in confusion, and most of them did not know why they had come together. Some of the crowd prompted Alexander whom the Jews had put forward. And Alexander, motioning with his hand, wanted to make a defense to the crowd. But when they recognized that he was a Jew, for about two hours, they all cried out with one voice, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. All right. So we see how successful Demetrius has been in getting his fellow craftsmen worked up, um, and not just the fellow craftsmen, but really gets the whole city uh, involved here, uh, and we see that at the very beginning where they, they um, declare um, their devotion to Artemis. Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. And again, the whole city uh, gets affected. The whole city's filled with, um, with confusion, and so a mob basically is created here, and the mob rushes into the theater in Ephesus. Uh, not like a movie theater, but think about it more like a, a sports stadium or something like that. So theaters in ancient cities were, uh, were these large kind of stadium-like structures that could seat uh, thousands of people. And uh, anytime there was an assembly of the people, uh, the, the theater is naturally where it happened because it could accommodate. So this is not a, a picture of the theater in Ephesus. It's just a theater. I can't remember where from. Though I think the theater in Ephesus is partially still standing. Um, but that can give us kind of an idea of the type of place uh, that, that Paul went to, or, or that the mob went to. So Luke tells us here that two of Paul's traveling companions, um, we'll, get, we'll get to verse 30 in a minute, but right here we see two of Paul's traveling companions get um, swept up in this, named uh, Gaius and Aristarchus. These are two fellows we haven't been introduced to before uh, this moment in Acts. Uh, so just getting their names here, while not knowing anything else about them, it's just a good little reminder to us that Paul had a number of different Christians traveling with him throughout his missionary journeys, including at times the author of Acts himself. Uh, we'll see that come back up starting in the next chapter. Uh, so, so Paul is really part of kind of this big team. He's not just this lone superhero doing all of this. He's got a lot of people with him uh, who are in and out of, of his mission work. Um, and then we see in verse 30, uh, I, I'm sure Demetrius and the, the craftsmen, they would love to, to grab Paul himself if they could. I mean, the speech was directed specifically against Paul, but for some reason, they don't. Maybe they couldn't find him. That, that I think, is actually probably the most likely thing. But Paul is aware that this riot is happening. It would be hard not to be aware. The whole city is, is thrown into confusion. Uh, and Luke tells us here that Paul actually desires to go out into the crowd, to go out into this mob. Uh, this is very bold, Paul, and, and um, perhaps he's hoping to turn this into a preaching opportunity. Uh, he, he probably does know, I mean, Paul is not a fool, he probably does know how dangerous that would be, but 
no, we've been reading his travels for a while now, and by this point, he's come close to losing his life more than once, uh, so perhaps he's willing to take that risk uh, and, and preach to this type of crowd anyway. Uh, or perhaps, and maybe it might not be either or, it could be kind of a both and, but maybe he also is pretty confident in the city authorities, confident that they will hear him out and declare him innocent. Uh, we saw that very thing happen just one chapter earlier when Paul was in Corinth. So perhaps he's trusting that everything is going to turn out okay. But either way, Paul is desiring to go into the crowd. Uh, but Luke tells us here how some of Paul's friends contact him. Uh, maybe they send a letter, or probably send a messenger or something, and they urge him not to do that. Urge him, do not put yourself at risk that way. Do not venture into the theater. Real quick, this is a bit of an aside, but it's, it's a worthwhile aside. Uh, these friends are called Asiarchs here. Uh, that's a term that may not mean too much to us, uh, but I do think it's a term that is worth exploring. Uh, you can even see, so of course there's Asia there, and the word RK means, uh, can mean ruler or something like that. So even in the, the word, you can get the idea these are probably some pretty influential people. And Asiarch is a term for a very high-ranking office, a uh, very high-ranking status in Ephesus and in the whole region of Asia Minor. Asiarchs were not only in Ephesus, um, but these are very well-to-do, very powerful, honorable people. And so just by this little reference right here, Luke is letting us know in the midst of this riot, uh, Paul has, he's made some friends in some really high places. Uh, he's got these, these really influential people with uh, positions of power, uh, and they are sympathetic to Paul. Uh, so a friend in a really high place like this, this was a very common thing in, in the way life worked uh, in Paul's time. Uh, they would often serve as a patron of people who were of lower status than them, uh, meaning they would sometimes financially support them or support them in other ways. Um, and then the ones that they were supporting, and the term for that was client, you have a patron and then you, they have clients, the clients would like return the favor by exalting the honor of their patron, you know, increasing their prestige in society. So it's possible that these Asiarchs are financially supporting Paul. Um, and, and we have had some other references in Acts, I've got a few of them from chapter 17 on the screen here, of some other really high status people. Uh, people who we may not expect, but some really high status people turning to the gospel. So maybe these Asiarchs are also interested in the gospel. They're not called believers here, but maybe they're at least sympathetic and open uh, and, and they're supportive of what Paul is doing. So something like that could be what's going on. Uh, but to go back to the riot now in verse 32, so we have all these people rushing into the theater uh, we have two of Paul's traveling companions caught right up in the mix. You can imagine they're probably fearing for their lives right now. And uh, Luke tells us that people are crying out all sorts of different things in the theater. Um, and he also says a lot of the people in the mob don't actually even know why they're there. They don't know why the mob has formed in the first place. Um, in other words, things have just turned into complete confusion inside, uh, inside the theater. And what Luke tells us next in verses 33 and 34 here, um, it, it actually fits with just how confusing things are. Because what Luke says here is kind of confusing. Uh, he says that some of the crowd prompted, prompted this Jewish man named Alexander to try to address the crowd and try to calm things down. Uh, but Luke says that once the crowd recognized or realized that Alexander was a Jew, uh, they went right back to their original chant, right? So complete failure to calm things down before, it even, before Alexander can even get started. They go right back to saying, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. So again, this is kind of confusing and fits with the confusion that Luke is writing about because we don't really know who Alexander is. Uh, we're not told why he's the one who's put forward to make a speech. Uh, and Luke doesn't even give us reason to believe he's a Christian, right? So, so why is this happening? Well, it's happening because it's, it's chaos in there. Um, we have seen before, uh, and we even talked about this, um, well, especially in chapter 18 with Paul and Corinth, but we saw how easy it was for people to 
uh, think of Christianity as something that was going on within Judaism rather than being like its own religion apart from, from Judaism. Even the early church really thought of it that way, right? They're following the Jewish Messiah. So it's this, this um, fulfillment and natural development uh, within Judaism in that sense. So maybe that can explain some of why this is happening. Uh, if some of the mob who, again, they don't all know why they're together, if they think that this is some mob about the Jews as a whole, well, that might explain why some of the Jews want this apparently well-to-do Jew or respected Jew to make some kind of defense of the Jewish people to the crowd and calm things down and say, no, 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 this is not about us. This is, you know, you guys are misunderstanding or, or whatever. Uh, but again, when they recognize that he's a Jew, uh, it doesn't work. We've talked before in here about how strong anti-Semitism, anti-Jewishness was in ancient times because the Jews were so different than everyone else in so many ways. And so people were extremely, I mean, in the literature, it's in like the writings that have survived, it's really strong. People were extremely prejudiced, extremely hateful uh, towards the Jewish people. Uh, so it's not hard to see when there's a riot going on how that's going to also become part of this and why they have no interest in listening to Alexander. Okay, so the mob has now rushed into the theater. Uh, things are really chaotic here. Uh, two of Paul's companions are swept up in this, uh, but Paul himself has been warned by his friends to stay away. And so let's see what happens next. Uh, I'll just read this passage for us, verses 35 through 41. And when the town clerk had quieted the crowd, so Alexander failed to do that, but here's the town clerk. When the town clerk had quieted the crowd, he said, Men of Ephesus, who is there who does not know that the city of the Ephesians is temple keeper of the great Artemis and of the sacred stone that fell from the sky? Seeing then that these things cannot be denied, you ought to be quiet and do nothing rash. For you have brought these men here who are neither sacrilegious nor blasphemers of our goddess. If therefore Demetrius and the craftsmen with him have a complaint against anyone, the courts are open and there are proconsuls. Let them bring charges against one another. But if you seek anything further, it shall be settled in the regular assembly. For we really are in danger of being charged with rioting today, since there is no cause that we can give to justify this commotion. And when he had said these things, he dismissed the assembly. In my notes, I, I just made a little heading for myself. Uh, and I, I entitled this section, The Town Clerk Saves the Day, uh, because that's basically what he proceeds to do here. Um, the town clerk steps in, and he calms the people down, and in the same way that this whole thing got started by a persuasive speech, the town clerk comes in, make a, makes a persuasive speech back, and the whole thing dies down. Now, when we hear town clerk, uh, that might not sound super impressive to us, um, but remember, Ephesus is not a small town. This is a big city, and uh, the city clerk was actually the highest ranking civic official uh, who would actually represent Ephesus to the Roman proconsul. The proconsul was basically a governor. He would represent Ephesus to the Roman governor. Uh, and the governor, proconsul, was also stationed in Ephesus. So town clerk, city clerk, this, is, this guy is a big deal. A uh, very, very high ranking person. And so he, he begins the speech here by basically calming down the mobs, um, Kind of addresses their core fear, you could say. Uh, they're afraid, of course, they're also afraid for their wallets and things, but I mean, the mob is now bigger than the craftsmen. Uh, they're afraid that Artemis is being neglected. And he says, hey, who among us is unaware? Like, you have to be living under a rock to not know how great Artemis is and how important Ephesus is to worshiping Artemis. Uh, and he calls Artemis, uh, I'm sorry, he calls Ephesus here the temple keeper of the great Artemis. Uh, again, we, we talked last time about that massive temple, four times larger than the Parthenon, uh, that's, that's one of the seven wonders of the world. It's right there in Ephesus. We could kind of compare the, the significance of this. This isn't maybe a great analogy, but it, I think it gives us an idea. We could think of uh, things like the Eiffel Tower in Paris or the Taj Mahal in India or our own Statue of Liberty, things like that. The clerk is saying like, hey, look at what we've got. Like, you guys need to calm down. Uh, this city has established its identity long ago. We know what we're all about. Um, 
he says that also, um, right before the yellow part, Ephesus is the guardian of the sacred stone that fell from the sky. Uh, some people think that could be a reference to a meteor that fell. Uh, it was very common in ancient times, and folks still do this today sometimes, but it's very common when something unusual happens like that to think this is a sign from the powers on high, right? And especially in a, a pre-scientific world, uh, there's almost no other way to explain this than divine action of some sort. So maybe they were viewing this as a confirmation of, of how important Ephesus is to Artemis or something like that. Um, and then the rest of what he says, I know we're starting to get low on time. The rest of what he says we can sum up pretty quickly. Uh, he says, hey, since everyone knows these things about Ephesus, uh, you all, the crowd, you all need to calm down, not do anything rash. He says they're basically blowing things out of proportion. He actually even defends um, the, let's see. Yeah, here it is. Even defends the innocence of the people who've been dragged in. Now remember, it's not Paul himself who's been dragged in, it's the companions. But he says they're not sacrilegious, they're not blasphemers. We might think, well, they kind of are. They're opposing idolatry. Uh, but again, these are Paul's companions, not Paul himself. Also, this idea of sacrilege. Uh, this was a very important thing to, to folks living in Paul's time. And it was more specific than just saying things you don't like about, saying things other people don't like about the gods. Typically, this involved things like defacing a temple or robbing a temple. Uh, and this was considered one of the most offensive crimes imaginable back then. It was often punishable by death. So it sounds like the mob, unsurprisingly, because it is an uncontrolled mob, the charges have really got ramped up. And while, yes, Paul and others are preaching against idolatry, they're certainly not defacing any property or things like that. Uh, so, so maybe that's part of why the town clerk, the city clerk, can say that they're innocent. Uh, and then he basically closes out here at the end by saying, um, if, if Demetrius and the other craftsmen, if they have any real serious substantial charges to bring against Paul and his companions, they should go through the proper channels. Uh, don't try to settle this through a spontaneous assembly, a spontaneous riot. And he even says, we're in danger of being charged with rioting. This is where Rome kind of comes back into play. Uh, if Rome were to catch wind of this, they might take some actions against Ephesus, and maybe Ephesus could lose some privileges or maybe have to pay higher taxes or be punished in some way. And so he's saying, uh, we need to break this up because we might actually make life harder for ourselves uh, rather than better by, by doing this. And then he dismisses the assembly. So I've only got a couple minutes left, so I just want to make uh, a quick application uh, because this has been a lot of, I know just looking at the text without a lot of reflection for our own lives. So I want to make one application that I actually made a couple weeks ago, but now that we're at the end of Paul's ministry in Ephesus, it's worth making again. Um, so this is where, again, Paul has his most successful mission work, if we're going to kind of use human standards to measure that. This is the climax, really, of his missionary travels. So he's been there for over two years. And again, not just Ephesus, the whole region has heard the word of the Lord. God's done some truly amazing miracles through him. Uh, we read last time, of course, about the folks who burned all their magical books. This time we just read about this riot that, that obviously wouldn't have happened if Paul was, was um, not having great success. That's why there was a riot in the first place. So I mentioned all those things. And I want to mention this passage from back in Acts 16. Um, Paul desired to come into this very area earlier in Acts, back in chapter 16. But at that time, the Holy Spirit did not let him. And so maybe now we can kind of see why. Maybe Paul in Acts 16 wasn't ready for this yet. But by the time of Acts 19, he's ready. So I know the bell is rung, but let's just be uh, open to God preparing us to do the good things that he's prepared for us to do. Uh, just like Paul was. Uh, Paul was prepared for this through his, other, uh, through his other travels. And so it's really exciting to think about how God can work through us in the future if we're open to him working through us now in the present. And I think Paul's life is a good reminder of that. All right, we're dismissed. Thank you.